Okay, welcome to um, Practical Astronomy for July, everyone. Did a, as you know, we swap from with film night. That's normally on on the fourth Monday. So this evening I'm going to talk about variable stars. And it, um, in the past it was one of the prime activities of amateur astronomers to actually do this activity, measuring um, the brightness of stars through a telescope or binoculars. Now, um, obviously they didn't have much other equipment, so the estimation of brightness was done visually. And um, nowadays we have cameras that uh, can be much more accurate. But I'm going to go over a little bit of history and also the different types of variable stars and what you can do today without really expensive equipment. So see if this is going to work for me. So you can see um, back in the um, ancient Greek days, Aristotle was one of the most influential philosophers and his influence went right through to the Middle Ages and he basically stated without proving anything, the stars are fixed, unchanging and eternal and it was commonly believed right up to, um, in the West anyway, up to the... Um, the Middle Ages where this idea was overturned because they believed the, the heavens must be perfect and um, whereas the earth was kind of corrupt and it was a philosophical rather than a scientific arg argument. There was a few things that seemed to counteract it. The planets obviously weren't fixed, they were moving around and changing their position at least. The moon went through phases so there was I don't think their argument was really that supportable and there were also comets but that was explained away by stating that comets were really not out there um, they were atmospheric phenomena and that, that was actually still argued until about the 16th century when um, Tycho Brahe proved by measuring the parallax of a comet that it must be outside of the Earth's atmosphere so quite interesting and despite that, there must have been people that saw variable stars like supernovae. They would have been pretty obvious. Um, but there's very little in the way of records before sort of um, Renaissance time or the Enlightenment times when there was unequivocal mention of stars either appearing as new stars or changing in brightness. So we'll... Uh, look at the earliest observations actually the um, earliest um, definitely unequivocal ob observation was Chinese astronomers in the year 185 AD recorded a, um, a guest star which was probably a supernova could have been a nova but um, um, most nova are below naked eye vis visibility it's very rare to get one that gets bright enough to be visible to the naked eye and you possibly wouldn't notice it whereas a supernova you can't really miss it if you're familiar with the sky if it's one in our galaxy you'd see it um, such as the uh, Kepler supernova of 1604 and the uh, Brahe supernova um, which was in the uh, 1590s I think so we had two bright ones in the Milky Way within a couple of decades of each other and there hasn't been one since so supposedly the Milky Way is overdue for one. So we can go on to the next slide. Now some, some of these variables, like a supernova is really a one-shot thing. It brightens up and then slowly fades away over a period of, of several weeks, sometimes a bit longer. But uh, Johannes Hawarder noticed that the star Micron City was actually not just changing in brightness, but it did so repeatedly. So this is obviously different to a nova or supernova, which nova means new star. This was a star that was there, but brightness changing over time. And this particular one had been noticed by somebody else, but they recorded it as a nova. And this guy actually realised the same star was repeating its increase in brightness to... Uh, easily visible to the naked eye right down to um, say ninth or tenth magnitude where uh, you could maybe see it with a pair of binoculars and definitely with a telescope 
uh, disappeared from naked eye view. And this was happening roughly every 332 days. That's the average period of it. And it was given the name Myra, which means wonderful, apparently. It's an official designation as Omicron City. And we can, uh, can we dim the um, centre lights a bit, Steve? Um, oh no, I'll, I'll probably best do it here. Uh, yeah, just it's a bit hard to see that screen. Uh, front lights, put them down to medium. Oh, that, can everyone see that? Or okay, I'll put them on. Try low. Uh, I, don't, oh, I could kill them all. Okay, we've got side lights and the front lights are off, so at least it makes it a bit e easier to see the screen. You can put the side ones back on. Oh, <laughs> Dang, uh, yeah, yeah, just okay. So if, if you want to observe the star, you can right now, but you have to get up at about 3 a.m. So um, if you um, wait till later in the year in the spring, it's a bit, a bit better. This is showing the view towards Cetus at um, uh, mid-November, roughly, and you can see the circle, right? Um, it's actually on the, the ray diagram for Cetus where uh, the line of stars here. So quite interesting if you're interested to try it out with your own telescope or binoculars, see if you can find it and see how bright it is. And since uh, these stars have been discovered as being variable, they've been observed more or less constantly as possible around the world and they um, note their light curve over, over the, uh, well, centuries in the case of this one. Oops, try going the other way. Okay, recently um, we had an interesting phenomenon. There was quite a lot of news about the star Betelgeuse which is the uh, second brightest star, sometimes even the brightest star in Orion. And it's, if you're familiar with Orion, you have the three belt stars, and then Betelgeuse is the reddish, reddish um, star, which is said to be the, the giant's arm or Orion's armpit or his shoulder sometimes, and Rigel being his, the giant's foot. So... Um, it's been known for a long time that Betelgeuse does vary on a, a semi-regular basis, but it caused a bit of a sensation last year by dimming quite a lot. So it was um, down to uh, probably um, as faint as Bellatrix and the other two main stars of Orion. So it dimmed significantly. And you can see what this shows here is that um, they're trying to figure out what was causing it. This is an image, a real image of the star. Betelgeuse is big enough and close enough that it's actually possible to image the surface of the star. There's very few others that's possible because they're either too small or too far away or both. But you can see this is the very large telescope using the sphere instrument with adaptive, adaptive op optics. And you can see the image back in January last year uh, uh, it's kind of evenly illuminated and in December um, last year, towards the end of the year, um, the brightness was sort of confined to one edge of it and there was a noticeable dimming to the naked eye as well as to the camera. Quite interesting. I'm not sure if it's been fully explained, possibly a, a bit of an outgassing of um, material from the star that cooled and was blocking the view. You know, I think there's several theories about what caused it, but it's now almost back to normal brightness, or as normal as, as it would get. So the types of variable stars, so there's two, when you look at a star and you see it's changing, there's two really, uh, two really possible explanations. One is called an intrinsic variable, which is something to do with the star itself, some physical aspect to it. Could be pulsating or blowing up or something like that. Or we can also get an extrinsic reason. For example, um, an eclipse like 
two stars that are rotating around each other, one can eclipse the other. So when um, the two are separate, you get the full brightness of each star. When one's passing in front of the other, um, it, there'll be a drop in brightness, and that, that's observed sometimes as well. They're called eclipsing binaries. So the other thing is um, the rotation of the star can bring sunspots into view, things, things like that. Oh, and there's, there's one important one that the um, observatory here and some members do, Jenny McCormick at her home observatory and also the Society Observatory out at CUMU. We do these um, extrinsic variable stars of a particular type called micro-lensing events. And I'll explain a bit more about those later. Okay, so... The more detail on the intrinsic ones, you can have pulsating ones. So what these are are stars that are, for some reason, unstable. So the nuclear processes in the core speed up, generate a lot of heat, causes the star to expand, it gets bigger and brighter, but then it cools, and then eventually shrinks back down. So it's caused by an instability in the nuclear burning in the core of the star. And this tends to happen when stars get quite old and they've basically got to the end of the hydrogen burning phase which generally proceeds in quite a stable manner and uh, Chris Benton would have talked about this in his recent um, introduction to astronomy talks. Then you've got uh, eruptive variables. Um, these are things like flares, mass ejections. Now, our own sun does this. But we're quite lucky is that it's the, um, the mass ejections and the flares are quite small compared to the total power output of the, of the sun, otherwise we'd be in trouble. <laughs> um, some stars, the flare stars, they can, a flare can be 10% of the total output of the star. Um, so if that happened to us, yeah, that would cause a major problem. So there's another sort which are cataclysmic or explosive variables. Um, an example is a, a nova and supernova. Obviously a supernova doesn't recur because the star is destroyed, but um, nova can actually repeat, and there's a couple of different kinds of nova that we'll talk about. Okay, so the extrinsic ones I talked about eclipsing binaries. So that's a double star where the two happen to be orbiting where the orbital plane is in line with our view from the Earth. So one star passes in front of another. Um, there's this well-known star of that type is called Algol, which is a, an eclipsing binary. And um, we've got um, planetary transits. These are a lot more subtle where... Um, I'd say a planet like um, Jupiter passes in front of the star. It will cause a dimming of the light of the star. But these amount of dimming, obviously, with a planet is generally going to be quite small, so it's hard to detect. But it's really interesting because the method can be used to detect the planets. As the, um, if the planet happens again to be orbiting in the right plane, so it's in our line of sight, if you observe it long enough, you see the process repeat. And if it repeats three times, you've got a pretty good um, uh, case that, yeah, it's a planet because the, the, the gap between each pair was the same length of time. You know then the orbital period of the planet. You know the size of the planet relative to its star because you knew how much it dimmed the, the star by. So uh, the Kepler satellite found several thousand um, planets using this eclipsing method. So th this isn't really one that is applicable to amateurs unless you've got fairly sensitive um, CCD equipment with a large telescope. There's another one that um, I mentioned, gravitational lensing. So this is what happens in this case is that if you um, look out towards the centre of the Milky Way, there's a huge number of stars in that field of view. You can see it if you go away from the city on a moonless night. You can see 
basically a, the glow of, you can't see the individual stars, but you see the glow of the combined light of millions of stars. So looking in that direction, there is a chance that two stars will happen to, or one star will pass in front of another and along the line of sight from the Earth. And the foreground star is then able to act like a lens magnifying the light from the star behind. So um, it's a, called gravitational lensing. And this was um, predicted by Einstein back in the um, early part of the 20th century. So um, he thought that it would be impossible to ever detect this because it would be so rare but, and difficult. But nowadays with modern survey telescopes, they detect these quite regularly during the winter season when the centre of the Milky Way is up high in the winter sky of the summit southern hemisphere. And uh, the, what the survey telescopes do, they monitor the whole core of the Milky Way area of the sky, but they can't look at the, the detail because they're having to take hundreds and hundreds of images of that part of the sky to cover it. And they just look for something interesting is happening here and then they get smaller observatories such as their own to basically do detailed follow-up. Um, if it's clear, just photograph this over and over again all night, and then they can use those images to monitor the change of brightness. And I'll uh, later on explain what you can learn from that. Um, oh, rotating variables is the other unusual case. There's some stars that have extremely large sunspots, so they're big enough that they make a significant difference to the brightness of the star, so that you can actually detect when the sunspot rotates into view on the Earth. Now, we can obviously do that in the sun because we're close to it, but sunspots like the suns on a distant star would be very difficult to measure. They might be a little bit similar to a Plan, uh, transit of a large planet in some cases, but um, there are some that might be a quarter of the surface of the star um, in some unusual cases. Um, you can, uh, it talks about really fast rotation speeds um, uh, can be a, a cause of that. Okay, so if you've um, been going to Chris's talks or watch them online, and he's been talking a lot about this um, diagram called the Hersprung Russell diagram. And so you can see this slightly curved line along here. Most stars are on that line, and it's called the main sequence. Uh, the sun is somewhere in here, and the sun will stay on the main sequence for 10 billion years. It's already been on it for 5 billion. And so it's got a long life to go till it uses up its hydrogen fuel. Uh, down the other end, whoops, sorry about that. Down the other end, we've got the um, these flare stars. I mentioned stars with massive flares relative to their brightness. They turn out to be quite um, low mass stars that are like that. And one of the well-known ones is actually our nearest neighbour, Proxima Centauri. So if you're orbiting that star fairly close to, to it, as you'd have to, because it's a lot fainter than the sun, so you've got to get close to it to have a, um, basically warm enough conditions for our type of life, um, you'd be at risk of getting um, zapped by one of these flares that happen quite regularly on those kind of stars. So the general, um, showing you the different types, luminous blue variables, um, they tend to be irregular. An example of that uh, you've possibly heard of, Eta Carinae. It's a very massive star, 60 to 80 times the mass of the sun. Back in the, um, in the um, 19th century, it had a massive outburst. Um, basically, uh, I think it's sometimes been called a false supernova, which um, some instability caused the star to burp out a huge um, um, eruption of material and it brightened to appear to be as bright as Sirius in the sky um, for a, a month or two. 
and then it gradually dimmed and you can still see the material that it burnt out. Um, it's called the Homunculus Nebula. We can see it on the Zeiss telescope and so, uh, some of you have your own um, eight inch scopes you should be able to see it's a little bipolar nebula on the star um, it's in a yellowish colour even though it's called a luminous blue variable we can't see the really um, white hot star because it's surrounded by this material that it burped out so it appears more of an orangey yellow sort of colour then you've got the, the two types of cepheid variables whoops type 1 and type 2, the, the delta Cepheids and the beta Cepheids are the prototype of those kind of variables. Um, they're interesting because it's discovered that the period has a relationship to the actual absolute luminosity, so they can be used to calculate distance, as ca can the RR Lyrae stars have a similar relationship, but generally the Cepheids are much, much brighter, so they're more useful for measuring really long distances. And there's a few other types, um, long period variables such as Myra. Um, and these are short period blue stars. Um, these are on the main sequence, but they have a maybe 1% um, slightly or semi-regular variation. So they're sort of detectable with cameras. Probably the variation's too small to visually detect. And then we have the dwarf novae and white dwarfs. Don't worry about DVVs and DAVs. They're not really something that amateurs can observe, but they're a, a type of short period variation that's seen in uh, white dwarfs, which, as Chris said, are the remnants of um, stars like the sun after they've um, blown off the envelope and leave a, a compact core behind. But... Um, you can get a supernova from these if there's some way they can accumulate enough mass from, a, say, a companion star. And dwarf novae, uh, another type of interesting star that we'll mention a bit. Okay. Um, well, some stars have extremely strong magnetic fields, and so they, the, the magnetic field can cause variations and their brightness of the, of the sun really isn't one like that, although the sunspot cycle is driven by the sun's magnetic field, but these would be more extreme cases of, of that. So um, that's just a, a list of um, what was shown on the previous diagram. The only thing I didn't um, mention was the... Oops, keep hitting the wrong button. T. Tauri type stars are actually very young stars that are uh, just in the process of forming and have only just started nuclear burning and for a while it, they're quite unstable so they undergo irregular variations and outbursts until they settle down onto the main sequence. Um, a nova and recurrent nova. So these are a type of um, cataclysmic event which is a real, really violent outburst but it's not enough to destroy the the star, like a supernova. And a dwarf nova is a phenomena to do with the accretion disk that happens around white dwarfs if they've gotten a, a companion. Okay. Just a, um, a bit on the Cepheid variables. Um, they're um, easily observed by amateurs because they're quite bright, even ones that are a long distance away. So... Um, Edwin Hubble actually succeeded in using one of these in the, in the Andromeda galaxy, um, Messier 31, using the big 100-inch um, telescope back in the 1920s. He identified by taking um, images of the galaxy over multiple nights. He detected a star and, and um, M31 was uh, varying and he was able to use that to infer the distance the M31 realised that it wasn't a nebula inside the Milky Way. It was a separate galaxy. And he extended that technique to come up with the Hubble expansion law by look, finding these in a number of other nearby galaxies. Okay. 
So you can see they're ma quite massive stars and they um, um, have a fairly um, high surface temperature, but they can vary in temperature. They go down to um, a K, which is sort of an orangey sort of colour, and G is the same uh, colour as the sun, a, yellow, a yellowish uh, star. So um, um, he got um, things wrong um, because what we realised in those days is that there are actually two types of Cepheids. So he underestimated the distance to the uh, Andromeda galaxy actually quite a bit further than he, he thought because the type of Cepheid he was looking at is actually much brighter than he'd realised. It was based on looking at stars in the Cepheids in the Large Magellanic Cloud and ones that are near the Earth to um, um, use parallax to measure the nearby ones. So it's kind of a, you have to build up a ladder of these things. So student or amateur project because they're bright and have fairly short periods. Okay, and this, this is actually the prototype Cepheid, Delta Cephe. And you can see there's its, its light curve. Um, anyone got on Julian dates? I'm not sure what the actual period of that is. <laughs> so you can see um, the, the day numbers, basically. So you can see that over a period of um, not that many days, is, um, it's, it's changing in a roughly regular period. Okay, are our Lyrae ones? Um, these have quite short, uh, have tend to have shorter periods, and I says they're fainter than Cepheid, so um, you need to observe closer ones. Um, they are quite numerous, so compared to Cepheid, so that's one advantage of them. Uh, that shows you the uh, variation is from 0.3 to 2 magnitudes. Okay, I was talking about dwarf novae. Um, these are a kind of um, white dwarf where you see there's a, a companion, usually a reddish star, which is expanded out, getting to the near the end of its life, so that its envelope is expanded, maybe even as equivalent to the orbit of Jupiter in size or Mars, so that the, the edge of the envelope of the star's atmosphere is encroaching on what's called the Lagrangian point between the two stars. That's where the gravity is roughly in balance. So that particular uh, Lagrangian is called L1. There's actually five of them. Um, I think Chris talks about this in some of his talks as well. It's um, related to orbital mechanics. The L1 one is the easiest to understand because it's directly between the two objects. So it's basically where the gravity of one cancels the other. So you can see that material that gets there, if it just goes a bit to the side of the white dwarf, it ends up getting pulled in and it forms an accretion disk. And you get um, a hot spot and that will, um, depending on the amount of matter pour, uh, falling in, that will get hotter and it's actually detectable. And every so often, for some reason of uh, dynamics, the friction and interaction of the particles in the accretion disk, it becomes unstable and it will suddenly undergo a, like a crunch and when that happens you get a big flare up and it's not actually from the white dwarf, it's actually just from material heating up in the accretion disk and these can you know, be uh, multiple magnitudes of increase in brightness so they're easily detectable by amateurs, the ones that are nearer at least. So, and they repeat because after that flare up happens it settles down again and then gradually it accumulates more material. Some of the material is also falling onto the white dwarf. And then we have a classical nova. So this is a, also a cataclysmic outburst, the type of explosion or flare up. And it basically is the same scenario as the dwarf nova. The difference is that eventually a lot of material gets absorbed onto the surface of the white dwarf and 
Sooner or later, there's enough of it, and a lot of it is hydrogen, which is basically fuel for nuclear reactions. The gravi surface gravity of the white dwarf is really strong. Temperature builds up as this stuff coming in. Eventually, it, it, it actually detonates. So you get a thermonuclear explosion on the surface of the white dwarf. It's not enough to disrupt the star, but um, it will flare up and um, brighten. And there's a, a well-known one in the southern hemisphere called T. Pixidus, which um, has done this multiple times, has been observed. It absorbs more material, blows up. Gradually, the material comes back from its companion red giant and bang, goes again. So it's sort of like a, not quite a supernova, but a fairly large thermonuclear explosion. And of course we have the supernovas. And there's, there's three main types really. The core collapse one, Chris just talked about these last month I think. Massive stars, um, when they burned all the fuel, fuel to iron, can't generate any more nuclear power, so the whole thing collapses, bounces, um, the, the elements in the core disintegrate because it gets so hot and you huge flux of neutrinos and, and a big outburst and the central part of the core becomes either a neutron star or a black hole depending on how massive it is to start with. You can also um, get with really, really massive stars that are at least 130 times the mass of the Sun. They're really rare, but some of these supernovas have been observed in other galaxies. It's called a, a pair instability supernova. So what happens in these, the stars are near the maximal mass of a star, could be even 200 times the mass of the Sun. And what happens is um, the core gets so hot that the, um, the, the heat in the core of the star is all in the form of gamma rays. And the gamma rays eventually get energetic enough to cause what's called pair production. They, basically the gamma rays convert back into matter in the form of electrons and positrons. And it turns out that when this happens, there's this huge drop in pressure in the star's core because the gamma rays are actually providing the pressure to stop the thing collapsing. Suddenly a whole lot of them convert into electrons and positrons. The core of the star collapses, but because it's still full of fuel, nuclear fuel, um, you get a massive detonation. The star completely is completely obliterated. doesn't leave anything behind at all except for a lot of uh, radioactive nickel. <laughs> so it does what a, a Type 1a supernova does, but probably faster, and up to 40 times the mass of the sun gets converted into nickel and other iron group elements. Quite the, uh, some of these, a few of these have been observed. The mechanism is still subject to a lot of research to understand what goes on in these things. And then we've got the standard white dwarf supernova, a type 1a, where the white dwarf, um, if it's got a companion again, it can keep accumulating mass. It might have these outbursts, but over time it can, maybe all the matter that it accumulated doesn't burn. And eventually if it builds up to more than 1.4 times the mass of the sun, the, um, the um, pressure becomes so great that it's enough to trigger the detonation of basically carbon and uh, nitrogen, oxygen type elements that the white dwarf is composed of. Basically you get a thermonuclear detonation and similar to the one above, the, the core burns into iron group elements, very short order, blows up and leaves no remnant except the debris. Okay, um, just an example of a supernova that we could observe with the naked eye back in 1987 happened, uh, uh, happened in the Large Magellanic Cloud. And this is a, a Hubble Space Telescope that zoomed in on, on the, basically the debris um, that the uh, supernova left behind. And you can see there was a ring of material that had been from an earlier outburst. And then the supernova is illuminated at the 
um, the light and gamma rays and other particles uh, has basically caused this ring to light up and you can see how the thing has evolved. It was much brighter in the centre at the beginning but gradually the material is, is expanding out and um, initially it would have been the light causing the, that outer ring to light up but it's actually getting brighter now that the um, material ejected by the supernova is colliding with it and causing it to re-energise it. Um, I'm not actually sure. Um, there was um, an interesting um, thing because it's, um, it must be quite small because um, I don't think you need a pretty large telescope to be able to resolve it. But the interesting thing about it, when the supernova happened, the ring didn't light up straight away. There was a bit of a delay, and so they could t they knew when the supernova happened quite accurately, and they knew when the, this ring first became visible. And from the delay between it and knowing the speed of light, they could use that to actually determine the distance, because you've basically got a, a baseline and um, an angular size of the disk, and and knowing the speed of light, you knew how long it took to get from the centre to the to the ring. So. That was an, another method of um, measuring distance that you don't get a chance to get that so often. It's called the echo, light echo method. There's actually another ring even further out, which was also illuminated later, fainter ring. So obviously this star had had some outbursts, a bit like Eta Carina, where material had been thrown off when it had been unstable and finally went supernova. So we can probably guess that V to Carina will uh, sooner or later do the same thing. Could be 100,000 years away though. Right. This one is just to explain this um, gravitational micro lensing. So we're looking at two stars and you can see this is a background star and a foreground star. And obviously, and there's us down here, just by chance, everything in the galaxy is moving, the sun is moving around the galaxy, both of these stars are moving, but every so often, just by chance, you get a line-up, and Einstein explained that gravity bends light, and you might have heard of the um, experiment that Eddington did during a solar eclipse back in the 1920s, where he looked, took photographs of the positions of stars during an eclipse and found that confirmed that the sun had bent the light, the star's positions were slightly shifted um, and of course the eclipse meant the sun was blocked out so you could actually photograph them. Um, so, um, so the gravity of the foreground star bends the background light and you can see we measure the brightness, it goes up, goes back down again. But in some cases, and that's what would happen if it was just two stars, you get a kind of a normal um, curve like that, not particularly interesting. But um, if you're lucky and there's a massive enough planet orbiting the foreground star, it causes enough distortion so that you get these strange effects where you get a little blip. Even though the planet is a lot less massive than the star, um, it's in optics quite a small distortion in the lens can have a big effect and um, technically um, this causes a distortion called a, a caustic I believe is the term and sometimes you can see this with um, light being um, reflected through in water where you see a wave pattern looking on the bottom of the swimming pool you see this sort of wavy stuff happening on the bottom of the pool but you'll see really bright spots and um, it's a similar kind of effect. And apparently um, people with um, suitably powerful computer models can look at these blips and figure out what it means. So you, you know something about this, Tony? Grant's not here, so he can't explain it for us. But basically the, they get the amateurs to measure these light curves. The, the big survey scope will see all something interesting happening. Quick, get onto this target see if anything interesting happens. You can get blips on the way up or the way down. Um, in fact, we had one um, 
last year, I think, um, over at QMU, um, Steve, you know something about this, where um, uh, we had a, an alert for one of these and it went past the, um, the peak and it was on the way down. They said, oh, it's too late, nothing interesting going to happen, the weather wasn't good. But um, young Andrew Marmont, I think his name is, if I got that right, he decided to go in there and, and collect what they call normalisation data and just by chance he got he recorded one of these blips um, at the point where they thought it was likely too late. So that um, gave some really interesting data for the um, the universities to um, analyse. And if you, if you contribute data to these, you can get your name on a published scientific paper and possibly discovery of an exoplanet. So... We can, and uh, if you don't have your own gear, you can talk to Grant about getting involved with the research team here, or, or us, Steve, or myself, um, or Jonathan, to learn how. If you live up that way, maybe learn how to use the Kermu Observatory. It does take a bit of dedication and time. Okay, now um, I thought I'd show this. Um, What's happening here, this is a HR diagram but of a selection of stars measured by the Gaia satellite, which is a satellite up there measuring distance to stars. So this is probably the most accurate HR diagram ever made because Gaia um, measures the parallax of stars down to about 10 millionths of an arc second, which is pretty incredible. It's um, something like a human here at the distance of New York or something like that, that it can detect that angular separation. And what it did, it also, is, as well as measuring the positions of stars, it's measuring their brightness as well. Um, I'll just uh, make that play again. And what it, because it's measuring over, it's, I think it's about 660 days worth in this um, particular animation, See if I can get it to go again. Might have to replay the. You can see what's happening is that the variables are actually moving around on the HR diagram, and you'll see that it starts plotting the the track. Um, our, our, some of the shorter period RR Lyrae ones are difficult because it doesn't repeat the measurements frequently enough for those, but definitely long period variables. You can see that they're not even over a period of a couple of years, the position on this diagram changes quite a lot. So um, we sort of present this in um, classes as being, you know, it's like a static thing and nothing much changes for millions of years. But in actual fact, variable stars are uh, moving around on that diagram quite significantly. I thought that was quite amazing that they were, that was one of the, the first um, things that was released from Data Release 2. Some of the researchers were really keen to, to have a look at that and to um, visualise this variable star stuff with an animation. And DR3 comes out at the end of this year, so the even longer period and much more accurate data, the longer it observes, that can re keep refining and refining the, the distance measurements. Okay, so for amateur terms, just some uh, housekeeping stuff. If you look in um, star catalogues and what have you, um, the way you can identify variable stars is because they have a, um, a Latin rather than a Greek name in their official name, like we have Alpha Centauri, Beta Centauri, or Greek. Um, if it's called R Centauri, then um, using the Latin capitals, then you know that it's a, a recognised variable star. So it might say R Centaurus, for example. Um, when they ran out of, because um, a constellation might have more than 26, or sorry, more than R to Z, they run out of letters. So they then go two letters, and, and then eventually they ran out of all those in some constellations. So they went, to, uh, went down to the letter A, and then they... Um, eventually ran out of letters, so they just use V for variable and then a number. <laughs> so uh, 
So that's what these things mean. If you see, for example, a star called R. Coronis Borealis, Corona Borealis, you know, okay, that's a variable star. And YZ Ceti and V603 Aquila. So just so you know, if you see those, what, what they actually mean. And I just popped this in just to explain what we're talking about when we measure... Um, star brightness, the method actually goes back to the ancient Greek astronomer Hipparchus. He did a star catalogue and he just ranked all the stars from first magnitude being the brightest to six being the ones that you could just barely see on a dark night. So for, I guess, um, historical reasons, they used this pretty much the same system but mapped it onto modern measurements and it was worked out that um, the difference between sort of an average first magnitude star and an average sixth magnitude star was about a hundred fold difference in brightness so each magnitude is two and a half times different so a magnitude one is two and a half times brighter than a magnitude two and so on you keep multiplying as you go along so you multiply two and a half by two and a half five times, you get a hundred. So that, that's how it works. But of course, so under this system, some things are much brighter than magnitude one. Even Sirius ends up with a negative magnitude. Sun minus 26. The moon is about minus 12, something like that, the full moon. So if you um, talk about measuring the magnitude of various variable star and or any stellar magnitudes, that's the system that's used. Okay, so if you're wanting to get involved or are interested, a couple of um, sites. The biggest organisation in the world that does this sort of stuff is the AAVSO, which has been going probably at least 100 years, I would think. Um, basically, they act as the database for all this stuff. So if you want to do this kind of measurements yourself, go to the website, they've got a whole lot of targets of interest that they want monitored, and you can submit, they tell you how to get the results um, that they need, and you can submit it to them. Um, there was a guy um, who lived down in Nelson, um, oh, can you remember his name? Um, right, oh, Albert Jones. He did this stuff with just his telescope from his backyard, visual observing, estimating brightness, and he got an honorary doctorate for submitting half a million variable star observations to the AAVSO. He passed away probably about 10 years ago now. Is that, do you remember, Andrew? Well, his experience was obviously because brightness was quite accurate. Yeah, within a tenth of a mag... He, he, he could tell, after with just heaps and heaps of practice, he could look at a field and say, oh yeah, that he could get it down to about a tenth of a magnitude, which is pretty amazing. A DSLR you can do, and a computer you can get hundreds of a magnitude, and CCD camera is much better, but it's a pretty amazing achievement. So if you're doing visual stuff, this is what the AAVSO give you. Let's say you've been asked to... Um, monitor the store T Centaurus, or Centauri I should say, and they're showing you, this is called a finder chart, and there's the star there, and there's a number of stars around it, and this is how you do the visual estimation, you compare it to these other stars, for example you'd say, oh okay, well it's, let's say that when you observed it, it was somewhere between those two, um, which are nearby neighbours, and you'd think, oh, okay, it's going to be magnitude 4.3 or 4.4. So you basically use these that are called comparison stars, that are stars that are known to not vary or very, very, won't vary enough to tell visually. And so um, that's basically how they do it. And you can get a chart depending on the field of view you see in your eyepiece. Um, so that might be a wider field of view. In fact, that one, I think it tells you there is 15, is that degrees? That seems quite wide. Maybe it's minutes. I can't quite read that. 
And um, so this is a, a narrow field of view. Um, so that, um, so you just choose a chart that's relevant to your setup, and you can um, submit your observations. And there's also a local um, group which um, mostly covers Australia and New Zealand. It's part of the Royal Astronomical Society of New Zealand. They have a group called Variable Stars South. So you can have a look at their website. And um, you, can, um, you can actually just do this. If you can't be bothered le learning to do it visually, you can just use a DSLR with a normal lens. Take a, an image, say, with a telephoto lens of random part of the sky. They'll tell you how to, how to calibrate your images. And uh, from that image, you, can, you might get dozens of variable stars off one image that they can get brightness measurements from. Oh, oh OK, I had a mention of um, Albert Jones here. Oh, back in 1963, he was the sixth astronomer in history to uh, submit 100,000 observations. And he exceeded half a million in 2004, which is probably uh, never going to be exceeded for visual observations. I don't know that not so many do the visual now, but it's quite um, interesting just to do it as an exercise. And he also um, discovered a comet, and he was also the co discoverer of the supernova 1987A that um, I mentioned before. He happened to be looking at variable stars and he thought, oh, that's interesting. <laughs> Supernova, so. Okay, if, if you're using some kind of camera system, then uh, rather than visual estimation, you're getting into what's called photometry. And usually what you do, if you have a CCD camera, you don't just take it on the raw CCD, you'll take the brightness with different colour filters. They use what's usually the UVB system. So you're measuring the brightness at different colour sensitivity, and that actually provides information for the scientists as well as just the raw brightness that you measure off, off the raw CCD. So you might measure the, I think U is um, ultraviolet Vs. Uh, sorry, that's not right. Um, B is visual, B is blue. Can you remember what U is? Must be uh, maybe ultraviolet. I've forgotten now. But it's um, you can use the, these filters with CCD cameras and with um, um, photo multipliers. With a DSLR, generally you have a colour chip. You can actually get them modified to take the colour filter off, but probably void your warranty of the camera. <laughs> use with anything else. Yeah, yeah, okay. You haven't modified your camera, have you, Eric? It's so, some real keen people do. And then you basically convert your colour DSLR into a monochrome camera. Uh, but then if you want to do colour photometry, you put various filters in front of it. Um, oh, yeah, that just mentions... Um, with a DSLR because you have your Bayer filter, colour filter. Um, they can still be used and they can uh, measure brightnesses down to about a hundredth of a magnitude with careful calibration. Provided the, um, um, the uh, stars are not to pack, jam packed too close together. Okay, that's it. Are there any questions? I hope I didn't see everyone to sleep. <laughs> Any other questions from the audience? You were talking about particular detecting variables before. Yeah. Um, I know it's a real amateur question, but can you explain how that standard candle thing works with figuring out distance? Like okay. I know, I know they compare brightness, but how do you know that? Yeah, it's well, it's, it's, it's something I don't know how well the physical process is understood. But it was noticed by a lady called Henrietta Levitt, who worked for the Harvard Observatory. And she was doing a lot of work on um, looking at um, star catalogues that were taken on, on glass photographic plates on their observatory. And 
she noticed in the um, large Magellanic cloud that um, they were these stars that they called Cepheids because of the the brightness and colour of the stars and the way they varied. And she worked out by comparing Cepheids uh, um, in the large Magellanic cloud, basically because they're in that cloud, they were known to be at roughly the same distance. And then she noticed that the actual brightness, although the brightness is changing, that the uh, overall brightness varied from star to star because some are intrinsically bigger and brighter than others, that the period of um, oscillation seemed to correlate with the actual brightness. And what that means is that if um, a star of a certain brightness, which you can measure as apparent brightness, and you can measure the period, then you know the actual brightness is, is X because of the, the period is shorter or longer. You can um, compare that period with the actual measured brightness to figure out how far away it is. Does, does that make sense? I think once I hear the information a few times, I'll, I'll probably feel yeah, um, it. Yeah, so basically, um, yeah, that the brighter the star actually is um, affects how fast it varies. And of course, if the star is in another galaxy, you can see, oh, it's varying this fast, and we know its brightness, we can compare it to the brightness of a star in the large Magellanic cloud that's varying in the same period. So we say, okay, those two stars are then for physically similar, and we say that the Magellanic cloud one is five times brighter um, you know, it's average brightness than the one in the other galaxy, so it must be five times as far away. And then you can measure stars in the Milky Way, where you can actually measure the distance using parallax. And so you can set up a what they call a distance scale. Has anyone got any better explanation of how that works? We call it a standard. These are basic standard candle. You don't know why it should be. So you can place it yeah, there's, a, there's actually a bit of controversy about this at the moment because um, obviously now with really big telescopes, they can measure these Cepheids at really vast distances and um, they can tell by figuring out the distance based on the Cepheid um, method of standard candles, it's possible to work out the, how fast um, the, the universe is expanding. You've probably heard of the expansion of the universe that was originally discovered by Edwin Hubble. But there's another method using microwave, the cosmic microwave background. And over years, the two methods have been refined and refined so that they've basically nailed the accuracy. But the problem is they now don't agree. The error bars don't overlap. So this is um, considered a big issue and cosmology right now that's trying to be resolved. And it could be because we don't really understand the Cepheid variables. Just going on to that question there about the standard candle, I'm under the misconception that you know, some supernova the A1 or the rest. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah that's another type. Brightness, yep. and, and so uh, you observe a supernova and compared to the standard brightness of the, the, that you've got, you know, it's like a, like a bulb light bulb being further yeah, away. Yeah, that's right. Start, you know, so, you know, it's so, so standard supernova and it's this bright yeah. and the standard one's this bright then it's a certain distance away in terms of this, you know, that's, distance. that's right um, because we can have big telescopes can see to really faint objects we can see type 1 supernova from huge distance away much further than you can see a Cepheid variable so for cosmological stuff the type 1As are used a lot for estimating distance and the reasoning is that um, they're known to be from a white dwarf blowing up and they always blow up when they hit 1.4 times the mass of the sun. So there's always the same amount of material to explode. So it's reasonable to assume that the brightness, the real brightness of them is pretty close to the same. So they, it's um, what they call a standard candle. If you know um, the distance to some other way to measure the nearer type 1A supernova, and you um, some kind of parallax or other measurement, then you can infer from that how far the these super galactic distance ones just by measure, comparing the brightness to nearby.
type 1A supernova. Yeah, because you because of observing them, they seem to have the same physical behaviour, right. like they're the same the same. Sorry. You can't tell the distance to other different types. Of stars no, no, because uh, normal stars don't have this behaviour. So there are um, other methods of measuring distance. In fact, um, there used to be a website. There might even be more than that. They used to call it the A to Z of measuring um, stellar distances. And it all comes, it's all really done as a ladder. First of all, you need to know the size of the solar system, in particular the, um, the size of the Earth's orbit around the Sun. And you use that as a baseline for parallax, where you look at distance or stars that are nearby and see how much they shift against the background stars as the Earth goes around the Sun. And there's your first um, baseline measure of distance. And then you hope that that method works out to a Cepheid variable. And then once you've nailed a few of those, you can, OK, right, we, can, we know how far that is away. We can then extend it to something else. And that Gaia uh, mission that I talked about, in theory, that should vastly improve the accuracy. Bef before that, um, they could measure parallax down to a, maybe a milli arc second. So this is a, a hundred times more accurate than anything we've done before. And it means that there's a lot more Cepheids and other things that you can measure the distance to using just this geometric parallax method, which we're pretty sure we understand how that works. So um, we're pretty uh, confident that it's measuring something that's physically real. Do we have any online, nobody online? Okay, so if there's no other questions, thanks everyone for coming along. Oh, oh sorry, did you have... Oh. <laughs> Thank you.